Hey guys, welcome back. Well, I've been doing some processing of some of those images I took with the RedCat 51 and the GT81 and using the ASI 294. And the most recent one I completed is the Seagull Nebula. And as I was looking through the image of the Seagull Nebula, I noticed a few interesting features and ended up falling down a rabbit hole. Let's take a look. Just for the sake of documentation, here's the equipment list and software list, at least for the most part, that I used in capturing this image. I'm using BIN 2 for oxygen 3 and sulfur 2 and BIN 1 mode for hydrogen alpha because I think that's where the detail is. And so I'll process that image separately, pull out the detail, and combine that via LRGB combination with all of the data in bin one mode, upscaled to bin one mode from the O3 and S2 filters, and then pull a little more detail out of this target than I would have otherwise. In addition, I am collecting about 20 minutes per filter on the RGB filters so that I can replace the SHO stars with the RGB stars. And then, of course, I'm using Nina for the overall session control and Pix Insight for the processing. This is the standard SHO palette. I am using my modified SCNR method to kind of balance the green, push the green back into alignment more or less with the blue and the red so that I'm getting more of the teal or cyan color on the blue side and more of the orange color on the red side. And I'm using the star blending technique that I also have a video out on to blend the RGB stars into this image. I think it's always useful, kind of interesting, to take a look at where these targets are that we take a picture of. I mean, we know the RA and the declination, but, but just how far away are they when you look at where we are within our galaxy and where it is within our galaxy? Of course, we are down here at the center of this galactic longitude plot for our galaxy, and galactic longitude zero degrees points us right back to the center of the galaxy where we have our friendly neighborhood black hole. The Seagull Nebula is actually located back on the other side at a galactic coordinate of 225 degrees, which makes it one of these targets that we get in the late season, the late nebula season, as we're starting to move into galaxy season. So it's one of these last minute targets that you get before you switch over and start taking pictures of galaxies. But it's actually pretty darn close, roughly estimated between 3,000 to 4,000 light years away and at least on the scale of the galaxy, it doesn't look like it's that far away. So as I was looking through this picture of the neighbor, there are a couple of features I wanted to try to nail down. First of all, what is the Seagull Nebula? If you go into Stellarium, Stellarium points to this structure as the Seagull's wings, which makes sense, and this would be the Seagull's head. However, Stellarium also points out that this is SH2-292, and it's called the Seagull Nebula. Now, I don't know if that's being... That's referring to this dark structure here that does look like a seagull, or it's just generically referring to this whole region as the Seagull Nebula. But it says that this is 1900 light years away. And if I look down here at SH2297, it says that feature is 6500 light years away. So there's quite a bit of variability as to where we think some of these features are uh, in this image. Now, if I call up a couple of stars here, they're all about 3,000, 2,000 to 4,000, 3,800 light years away. So that kind of gives us a sense that whatever we call the Seagull Nebula is about 3,500 light years away from Earth. Now, this is where I started looking at what's going on around some of these stars. And, of course, the star catalogs, there are several of them out there, but this is the HIP catalog. And I don't know if you knew this. I don't think I ever made the connection because I seldom look up stars. But this refers to Hipparchos of Nicaea. He was a astronomer back in the day, 2,100 years ago, roughly. And almost nothing, if anything at all, remains of his work. It's almost all lost. And we only know of what he did by what others said about his work. And one of the things that people have said is that he cataloged basically 850 stars. He wasn't using the RA and deck coordinates that we know of today, but he had his own method and it was reproducible. So he was able to track the motions of stars and, in fact, is the first person to note 
the precession of the Earth and the equinoxes, which is why our J now coordinates are different from J2000 coordinates because the Earth is precessing around its rotational axis. He is said to have said that he noticed the birth of a star and then he tracked that star in its motion, which shook him up a little bit because he had always thought the stars were stationary. And through his method of assigning and positions to stars, he was able to track this new star's movement and actually see the movement of the star, which made him wonder if maybe all the stars don't have some movement to them. And that's kind of important for our story here because we're actually going to be talking about the effect of the star's motion. So here are the two stars that I'm particularly interested in. When I was looking through the image, I found this one, this little arc-like feature here, and then identified that star as HIP 34301. But then I looked a little further through the image and found another arc-like feature over here associated with star HIP 34536. So obviously, what do you do when you get designations for stars? You look them up and see if they pop up in a Google search. And sure enough, the first paper that came up was this 2015 paper where the authors collect what they're calling here is the Extensive Stellar Bow Shock Survey. And this is release two. The 2015 paper is release two of this. Release one, I believe, was back in 2012. They identified, I think, 28 bow shock uh, candidates for that release. And then in this release, the 2015 release, they increased that by 45 stars. So for a total now of 73 stars. And interestingly enough, when you look at their table of all the stars they now include in their extensive bow shock survey, they are, in fact, pointing out that this feature over here, HIP 34536, was in fact included in their original 28 set. So this is a bow shock going around this star that this star is creating out in front of it as it moves in this direction. And it turns out HIP 34301, which is referred to here as SIR 5, meaning Serendipity 5, and they call it Serendipity 5 because they found this bow shock the same way I did, just by looking at an image and seeing this curious arc feature. And of course, they knew more about what to expect from the arc feature than I did. And so they included that along with a lot of other stars in their evaluation for the second release and have concluded that this star, 34301, is a likely bow shock candidate. But it's very interesting that out of the 73 stars that they have come across with these bow shock features, Two of them are actually in the field of view of this Seagull Nebula. This is the stacked image of the HA data. Again, I'm taking this in bin 1, and we're looking at that HIP 34301, which is right here. So you can see the bow shock form here, kind of a parabola-looking type curve. In oxygen, I don't get as good a picture because I'm using bin 2, and I don't have as many hours, quite as many hours uh, imaging this target with the oxygen three filter, but you can certainly see that feature here as well. When you get to the sulfur, I don't see a darn thing, but I can clearly see the bow shock in the hydrogen alpha and in the oxygen data. This is a very simplistic picture of a star just sitting in an interstellar medium where we have atoms of hydrogen, oxygen, maybe some sulfur, not so much in this picture, but some just atoms sprinkled about in this uh, space between stars and the interstellar medium, and we'll call that the number of atoms per unit volume, cubic centimeter, for example, cubic meter, and the mass of those atoms as being the density of the interstellar medium. Over here, we have a star, which, of course, is giving off a stellar wind at a certain uh, mass rate. So we have a mass of the stellar wind coming off the star. We have the velocity of the wind coming off the star. And in this case, we're particularly interested in stars that are moving and have some sort of velocity component into this interstellar medium. And what we're interested in is how does this combine to produce this shock front shape that we're seeing in our images? Well, in this picture, the star is located here. And this point out here, which is known as the stagnation point, is a distance away from the star, but out in front of its motion. What's causing this structure to form is that the air pressure, if you want to call it air pressure, it's not air, but it is pressure from the stellar wind, which is rho times v squared, that has to be equal to 
the density of the interstellar medium and the velocity of the star squared. If you look at this as if the star is standing still, then you can imagine that these particles in the interstellar medium are moving toward the star. So instead of thinking of it as a star moving into a stationary medium, the medium is thought of as moving towards a stationary star. And so what's happening is the particles of the stellar wind are colliding with the particles in the interstellar medium and where they, they balance out, where the pressures become equal, that becomes the stagnation point, and there is no net motion at that point, and as a result, you get a denser pileup of particles or atoms along this shock front boundary. And this distance from the center of the star out to the edge is that offset distance to the stagnation point, and it's also a very important parameter. But just keep in mind that what we're talking about is a ram pressure from the stellar wind colliding with the ram pressure caused by the star moving through a stationary medium, and it's when that collision results in all the particles piling up at a zero net zero velocity, and that produces the shock front that we're seeing in the image. What we ultimately have is a zone of gas here that is more dense than the interstellar medium uh, in front of it or behind it, and as a result of that, there's greater chance of ionization of particles because you've got this pileup of hydrogen and oxygen, for example, that are now being ionized by the star. And so because there are more particles in this particular region piled up within the shock front, we see a brighter feature in our images. So as I went through the 2015 paper, they referred back to this 1990s six paper by Dr. Francis Wilkin. And that's where I pulled that picture of the shock front boundary because his work primarily was to come up with the equation for that shock front boundary. And that boundary is basically a, it's like a salad bowl, a parabolic salad bowl. So it's this shell that's sitting out in front of this moving star. And he refers to this equation for that offset distance, that distance from the star to the stagnation point immediately in front of the star where that shock front boundary first appears. Now this equation was derived by some Russian researchers back in 1971. I downloaded that paper, but guess what? It's written in Russian, so I didn't get much out of that. But this equation is very interesting because it relates a lot of the parameters that are involved here into one nice equation that lets us look at what the effect of the different parameters would be on the presence and visibility of this arc-like structure. For example, the distance R0 is something we can measure from our images. In my particular image, I get 62 pixels from the center of the star back to roughly the middle-ish area of this arc here. And then if I convert that into radians by using my image scale of 1.92 arc seconds per pixel, which is, of course, based on pixel size and focal length, I can get to the angular measure in radians that we're seeing back here on Earth for that, multiply that times the distance to the nebula, which is estimated to be about 3,500 light years, and we can come up with a distance here of two light years or almost 2 times 10 to the 13 kilometers. So that's what we're looking at here is 2 light years. Now the velocity of the star, which is V star, is a very important parameter here. And we know of the velocity of the stars, and they're documented in many, many catalogs, including the Hipparchus catalog. But it comes out to be a number for this particular star of about 3.2 milli arc seconds per year in the negative right ascension direction and 3.32 milli arc seconds per year in the positive declination direction. And when you combine those together, you get a net velocity of per V star of about 31 kilometers per second. So that means this star is moving into the shock front at about 31 kilometers per second. And I wondered if that was a unusually high number or an unusually low number. And I glanced through the speeds given in the Barco's star catalog, and I was easily able to find stars that have velocities a hundred times higher than this particular star. And I was easily able to find stars that had velocities one-tenth of what this star is moving at. And if you look at the effect of the star velocity in this equation and on this standoff distance from the star to the shock front, if we were using a star here that had a hundred times higher velocity, that would mean, in effect, that this shock front would shrink. It would move closer and closer to the star. And if, in fact, this star were moving at a hundred times faster than it actually is, 
This I only have 62 pixels here, and if I divide that by 100, that means I'm within one pixel. So the star and the shock front would be within the same pixel of my RedCat 51 and ASI 294, and I would not be able to see anything. So I would not even be able to see that shock front if the star is moving much faster than it currently is. It could probably move about twice as fast as it currently is, and that would bring the shock front in here. But if it gets much faster than that, then you're just not going to be able to resolve it because you just your camera system doesn't have the resolution to be able to pull that out. Now, going the other way, if the star is moving, say, one-tenth as fast, well, that means this distance from the center of the star out to the shock front is 10 times farther away. But that also means that the effect on the local density in that shock front region is not nearly as intense. And as a result, the ionization rate through that shock front is not going to be much different than the ionization rate in front of or after the shock front. And so you might not see it because you don't have the tonal resolution in your camera to pull out that slight shift in tone of this cyan color. We just happen to have two stars moving at a speed within that sweet spot. If you take that speed of that star as the 31 kilometers per second and the other values that they provide in the paper, for example, the velocity of the stellar wind from this particular star is 550 kilometers per second. The mass loss rate coming off the star is estimated at 0 0.03 times 10 to the minus 6 of stellar masses per year. There's a lot of variability in these numbers for different stars. Plug those numbers in along with this star velocity here. We can come up with what the density is of the interstellar medium. And that's where I can come up with roughly there's one atom of hydrogen or one atom of oxygen per 5 cubic centimeters. 5 cubic centimeters might be the size of a thumb USB drive. I've been trying to catch up with my image processing of all the data I've collected over the past five months. And I just finished doing the first pass of the image processing for the Seagull Nebula and noticed some interesting arc-like features in the field of view. And I wanted to pull the thread on that to figure out what they were. And it turns out that they're associated with stellar bow shocks. And there's a paper that summarizes 73 stars that are a part of this extensive stellar bow shock survey. And two of these stars are in the field of view of my Seagull Nebula, which is kind of surprising. A bow shock is a parabolic 3D shell sitting out in front of the star. And so we're just looking along the edge of that shell and where the gas is most dense up at the, near the stagnation point. And so we get this pile up of particles out in front of the star at the stagnation point. It's highly dependent upon the velocity of the star. If the star is going very fast, through the medium, that shock front gets very close to the star and you might not be able to see it with your resolution. If the star is moving too slow, then the effect on the shock front is very weak and you don't get the bright edge of that shock front from the increased ionization because there's not a whole lot of extra particles in that shock front. And another thing that's kind of important is that we're only going to see this arc-like feature if the star is basically moving across field of view. Otherwise, we would not see an arc. We would see instead something that probably would look more like a halo. It makes me wonder, maybe some of those halos that I've been complaining about are actually stellar bow shocks, but just for stars that are moving towards me or away from me. Okay, guys, well, thanks for joining me along on this another track down the rabbit hole. Remember, be sure and take a look at those images you're collecting because there's lots of interesting little features and tidbits in there. Take care, and I'll see you later.